Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my, my name is Adam, and I'm the senior minister here at Corinth. If you're a, a guest with us this morning, if you're new, we haven't had a chance to connect. I, I would love a chance to say hello to you after the service. So I'm going to be hanging out at the guest service kiosk just straight ahead out these doors. So please stop by. Let me put a gift in your hand. Shake your hand, and uh, we'll get to know each other just a little bit there. I also want to say hey to our friends who are watching us online. We hope you're having a great day wherever you find yourself. And, and we know most people will check us out online before they ever step foot in here. And so uh, we, we hope we'll see you here in person real soon. But I think next Sunday would be a great Sunday to be our first Sunday with us here in person. Uh, so let's make that happen. Well, last week we started off a uh, brand new sermon series. It's a short series. It's only three weeks. And it's called After Life. And in afterlife, we're wrestling with these big questions like what happens when I die? Um, is there a heaven? Is there really a heaven? Is it, it, am I good enough to get into it? What, what if I'm not? Is, is there really a hell? And so we're, we're spending three weeks dealing with these just really big, fundamental, foundational um, kind of questions. And, and the reason we're dealing with this, the big idea of the series is just that whenever what you believe about your future can change this life. In fact, the way we put it last week is knowing your future can shape your present. Okay? Uh, knowing your future can shape your present. So last week we started off and we said, so what happens one minute after you die? And we said, well, your, your body dies, your soul lives on, and then we all face judgment. Uh, next week, we're going to get a chance to talk about the, the glory of heaven, uh, just the greatness of heaven and that part of the afterlife that's going to be amazing. Don't miss out on talking about the glory of heaven. But that means that leaves us this week with dealing with a very difficult topic. Uh, this week we're going to be dealing with the, the, the idea and the, the topic of, of hell. And I've got to tell you, just to be honest and be transparent with you, this has been very difficult to uh, prepare for. Um, my, my prayer has been this entire week, as I've been thinking through this, that I would be able to uh, be appropriate, that I would be able to uh, speak truth and grace, that I would be able to... Um, Describe the righteousness of a holy God and the horrors of, of hell. And my prayer has been that I want to be clear. I, I want to be helpful because if, if I can be clear with this, then that can change everything, right? Because you, you realize that eternity is at stake with this and that forever is a really long time. And if I'm unclear, I, I know that I can cause like an unhelpful fear. I can misrepresent God's goodness and his grace, his love and his justice. So my, my prayer has been, and it is right now, that, that I would be clear and helpful in this. And so uh, that maybe help out being clear. I want to give you the bottom line here at the top again, like we did last week. So this will just kind of set the tone for the message today. If you don't accept the reality of hell... You'll never appreciate the glory of the gospel. If you don't accept the reality of hell, that it is real, that it's there, it's forever, and forever is a long time, you will never appreciate the glory of the gospel. I mean, hell is just a difficult thing to talk about, isn't it? I mean, nobody really wants to, to talk about it. I can pretend like it doesn't even exist. Uh, Peter Kreeft is a... Catholic theologian up in Boston College, and this is what he says. He, he's spot on with this. Listen to him. He says, of all the doctrines of Christianity, hell is the most difficult to defend, the most burdensome to bear, and the first to be abandoned. He's right, isn't he? I mean, it's the most difficult to defend for those of us who are believers. It's the most burdensome thing to bear to even begin to think about. And so, therefore, it's like the thing that we just quickly, first thing we will uh, abandon. If you're here and you're like exploring faith, you don't know where you are. You know, it's like, I don't know about God. I'm not for sure. You're just trying to check things out. Or, or even if you're a longtime follower of Jesus, we struggle with this idea, don't we? This, we struggle with this idea that, of an idea of, of just a human being suffering for all of eternity. I mean, how could a God of love do this? It just doesn't seem fair. And so we do what Kreef says. We just, we abandon it. And we'll just pretend like it doesn't exist. They, they've done surveys on this stuff. They, they find that like 74% of Americans believe that heaven is real. You know, that there is a good place in the afterlife and, and that, you know, people can get there. 39% uh, believe in a hell, though. 
So not, not quite the same amount, about half-ish or so. You know, don't believe that. But what I find fascinating is that whenever they ask the question, you know, do you believe if you're going, are you going to heaven or hell? Um, 68, 69% of people say, well, I'm going to heaven, of course. But only 0.5%, one half of 1% of people who actually are on the face of the earth right now, are like, yeah, I'm probably going to hell. Now, my math's not great. But if 68% say, yeah, I'm going to heaven, and they still believe that there's a hell, that means that it's like 32% should be saying that's where I'm going. But we're at like this half of 1%. So, so the idea is that hell, for even people who believe in it, it's like, well, it might be a thing that exists, but nobody's really going there. Everybody's going to go to heaven. But then we read the words of Jesus, and he says these things. He says something like this. Enter through the, the narrow gate. For Say it with me. For wide. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. If I were the devil, you know what my strategy might be? If I could just convince people that hell wasn't real, or that if hell is real, that nobody's really going to it anyway, if I can just get people to not take ser hell seriously, then people would just live the way that they want. They would just feed whatever appetite they wanted to feed. They would justify their sin. They would ignore Jesus. They would have no fear of God. If I could just get even believers and followers, you know, to just convince them that, you know, hell might be real, but maybe not a lot of people are going to it, then, then they would become self-centered. They would seek the easy way out. They would pursue comfort. They wouldn't live with urgency. They, wouldn't be, they would just be lazy. They would never share their faith. If I were the devil... I think I might just try to convince people that hell isn't real. Can I just say it seems like that might be the strategy and it appears to be working. So let's ask the question. This is, this is a question we all wrestle with. If God is good and loving, then why is there a hell? Jesus says, why does the, the, the road, why does the gate, broad is the road that leads to destruction. If God is so good, if God is so loving, then why would there actually be a hell? Maybe you've asked that question. I want to give you just a, a few things to think through today. And so if you're taking notes, the first thing I, I would say is this, is, is that the reason that there is a hell is that hell exists to deal with Satan. Hell exists to deal with Satan. See, hell was not a part of God's original creation. It's not like on the sixth day afternoon, God created hell. That, that's not, not how this works. Hell was created to deal with Satan and his demons and their re rebellion. Think about it like this. Whenever the, the founding fathers started the United States of America, you know what the first thing they didn't do is? The first thing, their first act wasn't like, well, we better build a bunch of prisons. Okay, that's not what they did. They didn't just like go around building jails and prison cells and those things because they were like, we're, we're just going to assume that people are going to do good. We'd rather have a society that doesn't have prisons. But then they had to build jails. Why? Because people are stupid and they do stupid things. And so they wouldn't, people wouldn't cooperate. And so that's why they were created. God didn't intend for there to be a hell, but because of Satan and his demons and his angels and those things, he had to do something about him to punish him because Satan is that the thief that comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And so God is going to deal with him severely. And that's what hell is created for. Because God knows that, that, that he is, that Satan is the one that is behind every addiction, all abuse, every fear, every pain, all shame. That Satan's the destroyer, the deceiver, the dragon, the dark angel. He's the serpent, that he's our adversary, our enemy, our tempter, the wicked one, the thief. He's the father of lies, the prince of darkness, the angel of abyss. That he is, he is out to steal your joy, to kill your faith, to destroy your health, to ruin your finances, to ruin your marriage, and to take your kids. And hell is where God is going to destroy him and punish him for that. Hell exists because God is going to deal with the one who has made your life a living hell. He is going to take care of him. Yeah. This is what it says. Revelation 20. And the devil who deceived them and when he was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur 
where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. God will deal severely with the one who has made your life a living hell on this earth. Hell exists to deal with Satan. Second thing, hell exists to give people what they want. Now stick with me on this one, all right? I don't believe that God so much sends people to hell as much as people choose to go to hell. You hear that? God, God does not just send people off to hell willy-nilly, just like, ah, oh, they were made to be kindling for his fire. As much as people just choose to go to hell. The Bible tells us that no man goes to hell because God wants him to, 2 Peter 3, 9. That God desires that no man shall perish. That's not his plan. That's not his desire. And the Bible says that no one goes to hell because they just there's no way out because Jesus is our way out. He is our scapegoat. He is the one who, who is the, our way out of that. No one can blame anyone for hell. Nobody can do that. Uh, Romans chapter 1, maybe one of the most sobering chapters in all of your Bible. Because in that chapter, uh, Paul just kind of talks about how, how man treats God and therefore how God responds to man. And so in Romans chapter 1, verse 24, this is what it says. And this is up here on the screen, so let's read this here. So therefore God, say it with me, he gave them over. He gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts. Three times, verse 24, 26, and 28, it says he gave them over. He gave them over. He gave them over. In other words, what God is doing is he's going, if this is what you want, I'm just going to give it to you. I have tried and I've tried and I've tried. And if this is what you want, then that's just what you're going to, what you're going to get. And what is man's greatest desire? Independence. To be our own master. To be the captain of our own soul, to be our own savior, to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and to know that I can do this all. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. And so God says, if that's what you want, I'm going to give it to you. If you don't want to have anything to do with me, if you want to be away from me, then I am going to give you that for all eternity. You can be your own master for all eternity. Because here's the deal. In the afterlife, we finally get what we wanted most in this life. If you want God as your master and your savior and your Lord and your king, you're going to get that forever. But if you want to be your own master, your own captain, your own savior, for you're going to get that forever forever. And so hell is just simply one's chosen path going on forever. It is the separation from the most beautiful being in all of the known universe, God himself. It is exclusion from value, anything that matters. It's exclusion from God and people who love him. Hell is, make no mistake, it is punishment. But Peter puts it like this in 2 Peter 2. He says, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. And that punishment is separation. And it brings shame, anguish, and regret. It is body and soul. It is torment. It is misery. It is physical and mental. In fact, I love how this is put, it puts it this way. Hell is the final sentence that says you refuse regularly to live for the purpose for which you were made. And the only alternative is to sentence you away for all eternity. But it is more the natural consequence of a life that has been lived in a certain direction. A life in rebellion against God and his standards. It is simply you getting to continue that path for all eternity. Hell gives people what they want. And the last thing I would say is this, is that hell exists because justice requires it. You ever been at Kroger or Walmart? And you see a couple of parents there or a parent there uh, dealing with their kids and one of them's a spawn of Satan. You ever been one of those things? <laughs> 
you think it. I mean, it's just like, that demon child. But it's like picking on the sister or picking on another one. or they're, And you hear the parent trying to discipline. It's like, now, 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 Charlie. Put the toy down. Put the toy down, Charlie. Charlie, quit beating your sister over the head. Charlie, quit licking the ice cream. You know, uh, quit doing those things. And, you're, and then she's like, Charlie, you need to stop it. Stop it, Charlie. One. <laughs> right? You hear them, right? And she's like, Charlie, stop. Char- One. Two. Two and a quarter. Two and a half. Two and five eights. And you're like, just smack the kid, right? Just <laughs> pop him. Nobody's going to say anything. We're all going to turn around. Nobody's going to see what happened. Because hey, here's the deal. When is, when is Charlie going to stop it with discipline like that? Never. Charlie's never going to stop that. Because punishment that's only threatened but never delivered is useless. And in a world where there is no punishment, the law is useless. See, what we want to do is we like want to remake God in our own image. And it's like, oh, he's all love. No justice. No, no punishment. You know, he just winks at my sin. He's like, ah, oh, Adam, you shouldn't have done that. Oh, you knucklehead. He'll pat you on the back. Here's a Werther's original. Why don't you try to do a little bit better from now on? That's what we want. We, we want a God that's like, oh, sin's not a big deal. Sin's not, you just do what you want to do. But the problem is that's not the God of the Bible. That's not the God that presents himself here. The God of the Bible says that he will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. That's the God of the Bible. God takes sin seriously. He takes it so seriously. He gave his only son because of our sin. He just doesn't wink at it, play it off like it's no big deal. Sin costs God his son. Who are we to say that it doesn't matter? And as uncomfortable as it is, there is going to come a time whenever God delivers ultimate justice. And your reward will either be heaven or hell. And if there is a reward of heaven, then hell must exist. Justice demands it. God is a loving God, but there is a hell. And it exists to deal with Satan. It exists to give people what they ultimately want. And it exists because his justice demands it. So what's it going to be like? Jesus tells a story. It's in Luke chapter 16. I'd I'd encourage you to, to read it. It's a great story. About a rich guy and a guy named Lazarus. So rich guy's rich, like rich, loaded rich, like sell a shirt, feed people for a year, rich. Okay, that, that's how loaded this guy is. <laughs> Lazarus is poor. He's a beggar, covered in sores. And uh, it says that Lazarus longed to eat the crumbs from the rich man's table. Now, what this means is, you know, back then they didn't have like cloth napkins or bounty or, you know, those kind of things. They used loaves of bread as a napkin. And so they would wipe their hands off after, you know, their, their, their meal, and they would wipe their hands off with a loaf of bread, and then that would be the crumbs. And so what, he, what Lazarus is longing to eat, don't miss this, is the rich man's napkins. That, that's what he's longing for. That's how destitute that he is. He's poor. He has nothing. Well, Jesus says, it comes a time whenever they both die, and Lazarus goes off to Abraham's side. We just call that heaven. And that the rich man, he goes to Hades. Now, now what is Hades? Nobody's really quite for sure. It seems to be a, a, a temporary place for those without Christ. Um, I'll just say this. You don't want to go there, okay? Um, because Hades is actually thrown into hell in, in the book of Revelation. So it's not a, not a good place. And so it says that you know, while uh, the rich man is in Hades, he looks up and he can see Lazarus and he can see Abraham and across this great chasm. And so he, he cries out to Abraham. He's like, oh, Father Abraham, you got to have, have pity on me. I need you to send Lazarus down here and just let him just dip his finger in some water so he can just put the tip of his finger in my mouth just to cool, cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. So this rich man, he, he is in agony. And so this place that Jesus is describing is this place of, of fire. It's, it's suffering. If, if a Christian, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. For a, for a non-Christian, it means it's to be in the presence of agony and suffering. 
That's why hell in the Bible is called, it's described as a fiery furnace. It's burning sulfur. There's weeping. There's wailing. Gnashing of teeth. It's dark. It's populated. And because it's populated, that's caused people to go, well, we're going to have a party in hell. It's going to be the best time ever. All the cool people are going to be down there. No. It may be populated, but it is isolated, I promise you. It is not a place to enjoy. It's a place of no hope. Other passages, you might not know this, Jesus actually talks more about hell than anybody else. He talks more about hell than he does heaven. And Jesus, whenever he normally talks about hell, he doesn't use the word Hades like he did there in Luke 16. He uses the word Gehenna. And Gehenna is, is, is a real place. It's from the Valley of Hinnom, which is just to the south of Jerusalem. And the Valley of Hinnom was a place where they took all of their sewage, all of their waste, all of their flesh, okay, of people who had died, and they would take them out there, and it was a continual fire, and the smell was repulsive, and so whenever Jesus describes hell, that's what he says, this burning trash heap, if you can imagine just the smell and the odor and everything that's there, that's always burning, always burning, never going out, Jesus says, that's how hell is going to be, so what is hell? It is a non-stop, eternal fire with torturous suffering and unending pain, I love how this one guy put it like this, it is the land of no more good. It's, there's no beauty. There's no laughter. There's no peace. There's no friendship. There's no joy. There's no hope. There are no second chances, and it lasts forever. And this rich man, according to Jesus, is fully aware of all of this. He knows that his destiny is fixed He knows that he deserves it. And his only plea, his only cry is, oh, God, would somebody please go tell my family so they don't have to endure what I'm enduring? Nonstop. Eternal fire. Torturous suffering. Unending pain. Now, why do we all talk about this? This is painful. Painful to, to have to preach. Painful to hear. It's because what we believe about our future shapes our present. Now, you might be sitting out there struggling with this. And you're like, I just don't know that I can believe in a God like this. A God that lets good people go to hell. And part of the problem is, is there's a breakdown in understanding. There's a, there's a breakdown in understanding about us and God. Hear me. God doesn't send good people to hell. Because we're not good people. I know that's harsh. I know that's... Like, tough to swallow, but it's truth. We're not good people. We are sinful people. We are bent toward sin from the very beginning. Think about this. Did any of y'all's parents sit you down and teach you how to lie? I know my parents never did, but I got pretty good at it. Did you have to sit your kids down and say, I'm going to teach you now how to be selfish? Selfish lesson time. All right, here you go, Charlie. Here's what we're going to do. She's going to come try to take your toy. And as soon as she tries to take your toy, here's what I want you to scream. Mine! You didn't have to teach Charlie how to do that. But is he a selfish brat? Yeah. And so are you. We just have these things that are there. We are all sinners, and God is just holy and just. And if we would just be in his presence for just a, a moment, that reality would just become so stark. It would be some just so clear just how holy and perfect he is and how sinful and unholy we are. And God and his holiness cannot be holy without being just. He has to punish wrongdoing. He has to deal with sin. It's what he has to do. God is just. But God is not just just. God is also love. And love is not what God does, but who 
he is. So as we wrap up this morning, I'm going to read you some passages. And for a lot of us in the room, you know, you grew up in church, and so these are going to be familiar passages. Um, Even if you didn't grow up in church, if your grandmama ever took you to a Sunday school or a VBS or something like that, um, you've probably heard a lot of these verses, maybe even memorized some of these. Some of you, you'll be hearing these for the very, very first time, but for all of us, here's what I want us to do. I want us to hear them like it is the first time. So here's what I'm going to invite you to do. I'm going to everybody just close your eyes. Just close your eyes. Bow your heads. I just want you to listen. What does the Bible say about this God who is not just a, just a just God, but he is a loving God? And love is not just what he does, but it is who he is. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his, his one and only son. And whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were still selfish, while we were still liars, while we were still hateful, while we were still greedy, he sent his son and Christ died for us. If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, well, will he not leave them to 99 on the hills and go look for the one that that wandered off church here today. God is coming after you, but he's not coming in judgment after you. He is coming in love, and he loves you so much that he sent his one and only son, and nobody loves you more than he does. He laid down his life for those who don't know him. He didn't come for the perfect, but for the imperfect. He didn't come for the healthy, but for the sick. He didn't come for the righteous, but for sinners. Satan is a thief. He is a liar. He is a killer. He is a destroyer. But Jesus comes that you may have life and have it to the full. And that's what I want you to have. That's why we want people to know him, not just to escape the horrors of hell, but to experience the goodness of God, his love, his grace, and his mercy. See, that's what we want people to know. So why do we talk about hell? Because what you believe about the future shapes your present. And you will never appreciate the glory of the gospel unless you understand the horrors. Oh, Heavenly Father, that we would know your love. That that, that we would know your grace, that we would know your mercy, that we would know you. Jesus, you said wide is the, the path and broad is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way and narrow is the path. Those who will find life, you will find it. Oh, God, we want to find that life. We want to find the life that you have for us. We're tired of dealing with the one who steals and kills and destroys. We want to have life and life to the full. Help us to see today, God, that it only comes through your son, the one and only, the one who, while we were still sinners, he gave up himself for us, that he became sin for us so that we could know your righteousness, that he was condemned so we would never have to to be condemned. Oh God, we want the life that you offer us. Not just to escape the horror of hell, but because we want the glory of your presence. Oh God, help us to see. God, that's what we want. We pray this in your name.